Houston. Uh, welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Matthew Goodman. I'm Senior Vice President uh, here at CSIS and I direct our economics program and I'm uh, delighted on behalf of the economics program and our colleagues in the Freeman Chair in China Studies um, to uh, welcome you to this event on Chinese, um, China's economic coercion. Welcome also to online viewers. We always have uh, many, many people watching online as well. Delighted you could be with us as well. So I want to start by uh, thanking our sponsors for this event, uh, the Smith Richardson Foundation, which also uh, funded the report that we're rolling out today. Uh, we really appreciate that support. And the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States also helped support this event um, uh, through the Freeman Chair. So again, we really appreciate the support of our sponsors. We couldn't do anything without that support. So one of the purposes, as I said, of this event is to roll out a new report uh, that CSI's Economics Program fellow Matt Reynolds and I um, wrote, um, published yesterday officially, uh, called Deny, Deflect, Deter, Countering China's Economic Coercion. Um, this is the uh, result of about 16 plus months of uh, study that we've been doing of, Chinese, um, of China's tendency uh, over the past decade plus um, to use its growing economic leverage to uh, uh, pressure its neighbors and other countries to achieve certain um, uh, foreign policy and other objectives um, in Beijing's um, eyes. Um, this coercion is it's disruptive, it's problematic, um, and the US, the United States has an interest in trying to deter it. Um, but as Matt, who, by the way, is the real brains behind this project, he, uh, he read a lot of deterrence theory and game theory and, and then uh, gave a lot of thought to this, this subject. Um, as he'll explain in a few minutes when he introduces the report findings, um, Beijing rarely achieves its, even its tactical goals, uh, but in strategic terms, um, it, it often is counterproductive, this coercion. That was one of our kind of core findings. So we actually, in, in thinking about that, propose a counter strategy in which um, essentially uh, the United States and partners that are willing to join us uh, provide two other R's, not retaliation, but resilience and relief. Uh, resilience to help make our uh, partners less vulnerable to Chinese uh, coercion and relief if they do get coerced to help them out um, with that problem. And we think that this is a a more effective way to respond uh, than sort of tit-for-tat retaliation. But enough spoilers from me. Um, we have a chock-full couple of hours ahead where we're going to explore these issues, so um, we'll get started. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, watch uh, the uh, recorded interview that I did with U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, earlier this month when I was in Tokyo. Um, Ambassador Emanuel, as you may know, has been very vocal on this subject of economic coercion, and uh, you'll hear uh, that he has a, a very uh, clear view on the subject in, in a second. So after that, um, as he does on many things, by the way. Um, so um, after that video, um, then, as promised, Matt Reynolds will come up and present a summary of our findings and recommendations. Um, and then we will have an expert panel up here um, uh, moderated by Ling Ling Wei of the Wall Street Journal um, and featuring some of the best minds on China and um, people who have thought deeply about economic coercion um, in the recent uh, past as, alongside us. Um, and then finally, last but not least, we will be joined by Senator Todd Young of Indiana, um, who, as I think you know, is co-sponsor of legislation on uh, anti-coercion legislation in Congress. He will provide uh, keynote remarks and we'll do brief question and answer with him uh, at the end, and we'll wrap up at 10.30, uh, plus or minus. So we hope you find the next two hours informative, um, interesting, stimulating, and we look forward to your questions. By the way, I'll already preview that uh, when Ling Ling's up here with the panelists, um, you will have an opportunity here in the room to ask questions, so start thinking about what you would like to ask the panelists. So with that, if I can ask my colleagues to start rolling the tape with my interview with uh, Ambassador Emanuel, and we'll get started. Thanks. So let me start before we get to the topic of coercion itself, just about the kind of changes in the world. There's a lot of flux, a lot of uncertainty. You've noticed. Um, yeah, <laughs> really. So how do you see that? I mean, how do you kind of frame the overall state of the world? Well, uh, you know, sitting here and in this region, 
and, but it's also true around the world, and I think every country is making a series of adjustments to a, a reshuffling of the strategic deck. Uh, and I think what I refer to as three C's have uh, changed uh, every country in international economic, strategic, military, diplomatic. COVID, conflict, and coercion. And, you know, sitting here, you know, the time in which we're talking, Japan just adopted, first time in over 40 years, 2% of their uh, budget, or 2% will go of the GDP, will go towards defense spending when they had a 1% cap on it. So that tells you from where Japan was standing. Now, coercion played a role. Supply chain, as it relates to COVID, has played a role. For the United States, we're making adjustments based on that. Now, on the international economic area, as it relates also to other pieces, uh, I think that the driving factor of cost and efficiency have been replaced by stability and sustainability. Those are now the North Stars of international economics. That market access was a driving factor, still is, but energy security is now gone from kind of second tier to top tier as an equal to uh, market access. And measurements used to be always about um, how much you sell. Today it's how much data you collect. And those are kind of not limited to, but the three things on the economic front that have altered in relationship to COVID conflict and coercion. No country today in this region is not looking at their energy portfolio and asking, where are we vulnerable? Or where are we not vulnerable? That's true here in Japan, that's true in Korea, that's true in the Philippines, that's true in Vietnam. And you just go down the list. Whether you're importer, exporter, integrated with your climate goals, but your energy security, what does it mean from the uh, resource allocation? And then what does it mean from accessing it if you're an importer? Well, a lot there to talk about, but let's talk a little about coercion. So what are you, what are you worried about? What is, what is the problem <laughs> with economic coercion? And you've, you've started to talk about hard and soft coercion. Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, well, first of all, you got to, what is coercion? Yeah. Coercion is to achieve a political objective with economic tools. Um, and in this region, starting Japan was really kind of the first victim of China's coercion back in rare earth materials in 2015. Yeah. And it was based on a political disagreement between China and Japan. Korea in 2017 puts a THAAD uh, in, and China cuts them off on both tourism, their big supermarket, boycotts it. Australia had the audacity to say, where did COVID start? They get their wheat, their wine, everything. Um, so that's hard coercion, and it's based on a political disagreement between China and the other country, and they cut off market access, they cut off trade, uh, they do intellectual property theft. So there's a series of tools in the coercion toolbox. And it's because of a political disagreement, they penalize you economically in the user market and other tools in the economic kind of basket to penalize you and break you. The United States has also been a target. When an NBA team, the Houston Rockets, part of the management or part of the coaching, makes a comment about Hong Kong, they cut off the NBA and the NBA, sorry for this, but folds like a cheap soup. Companies that complain about China but refuse to file a case with us, with the United States, and I saw that as chief of staff at the WTO, coercion. Soft, not as hard as what they did in Japan and South Korea, not because of market size, but because of the implied power. So there's hard and soft coercion, understanding it, that it starts at the top, which is we politically disagree with you or, or some political disagreement, diplomatic, whatever, we're going to use all these economic tools to break you. Now, there are some reasons, and you and I are sitting here talking two weeks after three weeks, China basically said to their coercion and isolation of Australia, we're throwing the towel in. Countries that have economic trade agreements with other countries, allies, other opportunities in the economic portfolio, survive, and China can be beaten on this. But you have to apply a set of economic tools in an anti-coercion effort to beat back China's coercion. If Lithuania was not part of the EU, they would have been in a different place. Because they had the EU economic alliance and market, Lithuania survived China's economic coercion. That's just a fact. So you can, there are lessons to be drawn. It's not like throwing up your hands. But you, countries can withstand the pressure 
if there is an organized, concerted effort by other countries to build an anti-coercion coalition. And so, a little more specifically, what, what do you think is the, or what are the elements of, of a response that are most effective to try to deter China from doing this uh, so regularly? Well, uh, the biggest way to deter China is by being, making sure that other countries that have been convicted, can, they know they can survive. Mm -hmm. That means a series of things. The United States, I mean, from a perspective of the U.S. ambassador, we have a massive energy portfolio. I mean, Russia tried to use energy as an economic coercion tool against Europe. The U.S.-Europe Energy Council that was set up by President Biden after the war, incredibly successful in the anti-coercion effort. Incredibly, there's a, there's a paradigm shift when you look at the amount of LNG, you look at the type of investments we make, and it's not just LNG, there's Romania is now looking at an SMR new scale nuclear. So it's not just LNG, although that was the most pressing. There's a series of things on the energy tools that become part of the anti-coercion coalition and coming in and developing uh, a set of tools. Now, the basic premise, if you look at Australia, if you look at Lithuania, the goal is to build a coalition that's broad, deep, and capable. Energy is a piece of that. You can't build something that beats back the most pernicious economic tool China has if the United States won't lead. That's true on strategic terms, diplomatic terms, political terms, military terms. It is also true on economic terms. So the United States must take the lead in defining what an anti-coercion coalition is. Europe has been targeted. America came to Europe's rescue. Lesson. Australia was targeted. America, other allies, came to Australia's defense. Australia not only survived, but thrived. There is a lesson in all these that you've got to put together a coalition, take an assessment of all your tools, build a, a healthy set of instruments led by the United States, and then when other smaller countries get targeted, we will come to their defense and show them that we will stand by them when they make a political stand. Right. I mean, clearly the U.S. has to has to be in the lead. Well, we can't be on the sidelines. We can't, we can't be on the sidelines. We we can be. And we can lead. I believe we should lead the discussion. We have an interest, political, strategic interest. That said, it will not really go anywhere if the United States is either on the sidelines or just one of many kind of shrugging their shoulders. It has to set the terms. Right. But Japan is also important, third largest economy in the world, mm -hmm. or second without not counting China. So um, what do you say to the Japanese, or what do they say to you about this? Well, the good news is, to uh, Prime Minister Kishida's credit, he's going to make uh, coercion, international economic rules, a centerpiece of the G7 that will be held here in May. Um, I mean, you could also see, and I do, it doesn't mean people will agree with this, I think the way China has used the debt trap, that's part of coercion where they have broken other countries' in, uh, political independence. Take a look at Pakistan, take a look at Sri Lanka, take a look at any number of African uh, countries. Those, those tools have been there. So I think you, and then we come to the rescue through, in, you know, IMF and other type of international instruments, basically using post-World War II economic tools to solve China's economic uh, strangulation of these countries. So I think that the big thing that Japan could do is, and the lesson I think here, last year, um, not just working on the defense um, uh, budget, we worked with uh, Japan to develop a CFIUS-like economic tool, a complementary screening. Yeah, an investment screening. They didn't exactly Xerox ours, but it was kind of a guardrail, it was a benchmark to look at lessons learned, how to improve, and we're doing our own modernization of the CFIUS uh, laws and, uh, and um, uh, regulations. Japan used that as a way to then put in place, post-COVID, post-coercion, post the conflict, a set of, uh, uh, a piece of legislation that created their own kind of set of regulations on investments into critical technologies and industries, etc. Coercion uh, Japan, close to the field, the number one target, back, going back to 
Uh, you said 2010. I remember it was 2015, but I'm a, uh, you're the scholar. Recurring thing. You're the scholar. Yeah. I'm the hack, right. so I'll, I'll go with your number as 2010. We'll fact check it later. Make sure. <laughs> if I'm <laughs> right, I get, if I'm right, I get I get a bonus All on right. my postdoctoral yeah. work. Uh, but so I would say Japan, knowing full well, having been targeted on critical min, uh, uh, minerals, um, they know a rare earth. Uh, minerals. They know what it took to survive. They know what it means to be the victim, and they know how to give us, I think, a better sense of what are the tools that are part of an anti-coercion -co coalition, and what are the best instruments. I'm looking at this as a diplomat and as somebody that basically steeped in politics. And when you look at an Australia, a South Korea, a Lithuania, a Philippine pine, uh, pineapples. You look at um, uh, what happened in Japan. The, the one common theme about how countries survived it and then thrived was a healthy set of economic relationships with other countries that then give them the kind of market access that are shock absorbers to handle it. And in the end of the day, China can't break a coalition of many. Right. Key part of sort of yeah. the resilience and, and being able to withstand this. Uh, look, this is a very hot topic in Washington, as you know. Uh, you've been a real thought leader um, back there. We we um, know there's more to come. A couple of pieces of legislation in Congress that are coming through. All these reports from think tanks. Um, so it's a it's your contribution is very helpful, and I really appreciate your uh, your time and interest in this. You you guys, I mean, you have been uh, from our first time when I was just being uh, nominated. We've talked about economic coercion. There's another report out. Uh, by a think tank, you know, kind of a sister think tank in Australia. Yeah. And here Perfect. in the embassy, we're working kind of on a, what I would call an analysis that looks at what are the themes or what are the common practices by China. Which countries survive? Which countries fold? And the biggest kind of thing that we come out of there is both hard coercion, like Korea was a target, Australia, Japan, and then soft. Our one country is the soft ones are like what happened in the NBA or individual companies by the United States that get pressured. And when you, when somebody, a company like, or an institution like the NBA folds, it sends a message to other countries that are vulnerable. If they thrive, like Australia, Japan, that, that also sends a message. And this is not a foreign thing for the United States. Our companies have been targeted and our management in many cases, mm -hmm. have succumbed to the pressure, both subtle, and there's nothing subtle about Ron. <laughs> okay, so, and there's overt, and then there's right. covert, which is, go ahead, we're going to steal your intellectual property, there's going to be economic theft, and we're going to get cut off the market. And they succumb to that. And we should, so this is not like foreign to the United States shores. It has hit our shores and our major institutional companies that we are very proud of, multinationals, have folded. Well, terrific. Really thanks for your contributions here and generally on this topic. Again, you're being heard in Washington and I think it's having impact and so we really appreciate well, you spending time with us and we'll continue the conversation uh, the rest of uh, We're going to go from conversation to let's get this legislation done. That's America's right. leadership is needed here. Thanks so much, Mr. Bassett. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, good morning. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy uh, schedules to be here today for our uh, report rollout on, on countering China's economic coercion. I want to say thank you again to uh, Matthew Goodman for the introduction. And as a reminder, uh, my name is Matthew Reynolds. I am a fellow here in the economics program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And I am uh, one of the co-authors of uh, this report entitled Deny, Deflect, Deter, Countering China's Economic uh, Coercion. And briefly before the panel this morning, I'm going to quickly go over uh, some of our key findings and takeaways and recommendations from uh, this report. <coughs> this report uh, lasted roughly 16 months, and it began with a deep dive into eight case studies of Chinese economic coercion uh, that spanned roughly the last 13 years. Uh, the earliest case we looked at was Japan's arrest of a Chinese fishing boat captain after that fishing boat captain rammed uh, two Japanese Coast Guard vessels. Uh, that happened in 2010, and 
Beijing's response was to cut off uh, all rare earth, rare earth mineral exports to uh, Japan. And then our most recent case we explored uh, was Lithuania's decision to open uh, a Taiwanese representative office in Vilnius in 2021. Uh, and in response there, China uh, implemented a de facto embargo, uh, economic embargo of Lithuania. So from those eight case studies, uh, we came away with several key characteristics of China's economic coercion that we identified. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to go over uh, a couple of those today that we think are most important and most salient. Uh, so first, uh, China uh, routinely or most often implements its economic coercion through informal means. Uh, this informality uh, carries or provides Beijing with a degree of plausible deniability uh, that complicates the response of the targeted country. Uh, but it's also important to note that this informality also carries costs for China uh, in the sense uh, that it makes it difficult for China uh, to actually enforce those economic sanctions. Uh, then we also notice that China uh, prefers to deploy uh, its economic coercion against items in which it enjoys an asymmetric advantage in the terms of trade. Uh, however, uh, China also demonstrated a risk and cost aversion throughout these eight case studies, uh, which complicates China's ability to inflict uh, a significant macroeconomic cost on the targeted country. Uh, now, we do want to say that uh, uh, it, China's economic coercion is costly for those firms and sectors that are targeted. Uh, but again, at the macroeconomic level across these case studies, uh, we did not see a significant economic cost. And in fact, in some cases like uh, South Korea, trade between China and South Korea actually increased by 14 percent uh, during this course of uh, the course of campaign launched by Beijing. This feeds into perhaps our most uh, surprising and interesting takeaway from these case studies. And that is simply that China is just not very good at economic uh, coercion. So this chart here behind me is from, uh, it's important to mind, this is from Beijing's uh, perspective. Uh, but uh, even though China's tactical or coercion is, is sometimes able to achieve its short-term tactical goal, uh, in most cases, uh, China's economic coercion uh, carries uh, strategic and long-term cost uh, for China. So uh, to go back to the Japan case again, uh, Japan did release the, the Chinese fishing boat uh, captain, but Tokyo refused to apologize as Beijing demanded. Uh, and also after uh, the course of incident, uh, Japan initiated a years-long campaign or initiative to reroute its rare earth supply chains away from China, uh, reducing uh, its dependency on China for rare earths from around 90% uh, in 2010 down to closer to 50% uh, today. So this finding leads to another interesting uh, insight from our report, and that is China's economic coercion intersects U.S. interests in a, a perhaps a more counterintuitive, nuanced way uh, than uh, one might at first uh, expect. So uh, China's economic coercion certainly works against U.S. interests by challenging the rules-based international economic order, uh, dividing U.S. allies and partners, and making it difficult to uh, build a coalition or build coalitions to push back against Beijing's malign behavior in other domains. However, more uh, counterintuitively, China's economic coercion can actually work uh, with U.S. interests in the sense that it drives the coupling and trade diversification. Again, as we saw in that rare earths case with Japan, uh, it harms China's image around the world and it pushes targets of China's economic co coercion closer to the United States. So based on these key insights and characteristics of China's economic coercion, our, our report proposes a counter strategy that aims to deter uh, China's economic coercion by building resilience and providing relief to targeted countries. Uh, we believe uh, doing this, we can mitigate the cost of U.S. allies while indirectly raising the cost of coercion uh, for Beijing. And we propose 11 recommendations for how the United States can do this in our report. And we bucket those recommendations into two broad categories. We have both proactive uh, resilience building policies uh, to be implemented uh, regardless of Chinese behavior. And then we have reactive relief oriented policies uh, that provide relief to targeted U.S. allies and partners and would be implemented uh, after China begins uh, a course of campaign against a target uh, country. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to quickly go over a couple of these recommendations on the proactive side in our report. Uh, so our first recommendation is that the United States establish an interagency committee on countering China's economic coercion. We call this CORCOM in our, our report. Uh, so this committee would pool resources and knowledge across the U.S. government and help coordinate a response to an individual case of Chinese economic uh, coercion. Uh, then we also recommend uh, that the United States uh, uh, embed uh, concerns about China's economic coercion and ongoing supply chain resiliency initiatives that we have seen pop up around the world in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Uh, and then we also recommend, it's our sixth recommendation here, uh, that the U.S. establish an anti-coercion uh, instrument uh, modeled somewhat on the e EU's ACI, anti-coercion instrument. Uh, this U.S. ACI uh, would uh, bundle uh, a set of new and existing tools uh, into a single instrument that the United States could then use to deploy to provide relief to targeted countries in the case of uh, an incidence of Chinese economic coercion. Uh, so some of those tools that we recommend including in this U.S. ACI include a new uh, coercion relief fund, uh, but also existing tools such as temporary tariff relief for targeted uh, goods and export uh, financing, among others. And then we have uh, four policy recommendations on our relief, uh, our reactive relief uh, bucket. So uh, these are the policies that you would see the U.S. implement in case of uh, an incident of Chinese economic coercion. Uh, since there's only four here, I'll quickly go, go through them. The first challenge is how do you define China's economic coercion? Uh, because China implements its coercion in an informal manner, that makes it very difficult for the United States to put on paper a catch-all definition of what constitutes as economic uh, coercion. So instead, we recommend that you empower this CORCOM, this committee, uh, to make a recommendation to the president as to whether a specific case of Chinese economic coercion meets that threshold of actionable coercion. Uh, if it does, then the United States would deploy those tools under the USACI, which we have built in flexibility uh, to release or to use certain tools based on the certain characteristics of an individual case of China's economic coercion. And in our report, you'll see we identify a lot of the different tools that China will use on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and then our third recommendation here is that the United States uh, support WTO cases that are brought in response to specific incidents, incidents of uh, China's economic coercion. And then we also recommend embedding this entire uh, response in a diplomatic messaging campaign that both draws attention to the relief that the U.S. is providing allies, uh, shaming China for its problematic behavior, and messaging to Beijing that its coercion is likely uh, to fail. And then although this diplomatic messaging uh, recommendation is on the, the relief side, uh, we also would recommend, you know, beginning the diplomatic messaging campaign proactively and pointing to uh, U.S. efforts to build resiliency and pointing, drawing attention to China's uh, that to Beijing that its coercion is unlikely uh, to be effective. And then one more point I'll make here is that these two components of uh, our counter strategy are mutually reinforcing. As we speed market adjustments by providing relief, we are also building resiliency to future uh, incidences of Chinese economic uh, coercion. So uh, our strategy is predicated on deterring China uh, through uh, instilling in Beijing a fear of failure rather than a fear of retaliation. And we think this approach of resiliency and relief is more credible than a strategy predicated on punching directly back against China is also more easily multilateralizable. It speeds the market adjustments we are already seeing take place naturally in response to China's economic coercion. And most importantly, it is the response that U.S. allies and partners most want. Uh, in the course of our 16 months of research, we held uh, several conversations under the Chatham House rule with officials from targeted countries. And when it came up, uh, they all felt that uh, a U.S. retaliation would only make the situation worse and lead to escalation that would likely be targeted against the U.S. ally and partner rather than at the U.S. itself. So in building a strategy for U.S. allies and partners, we believe that we should listen to what U.S. allies and partners want. And then on a final note, we believe that this counter strategy provides the United States with a superior diplomatic message. Uh, in the sense that it allows the United States to maintain uh, the moral high ground. And then on a final note before I turn it over to our panelists, I uh, just want to tie this back into our sort of our key takeaway that China's economic coercion is largely ineffective and the U.S. response uh, should take that into consideration and be careful not to overreact to this problem and play into China's hand. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Ling Ling from the Wall Street Journal uh, to introduce our panelists. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ling Ling Wei. I'm the Chief China Correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, to moderate this panel on such an important topic. Um, you know, what really uh, striking, you know, as I read through report um, by Matthew Reynolds and Matthew Goodman was that um, 
you know, how detailed and thoughtful the whole report is. Uh, as journalists, we often, you know, write, we would write about stories as each of those coercion cases occurred. But this report really, you know, put everything together, tried to connect the dots, and un um, drill down the critical questions of really why China does what it has done and, you know, how effective the tactics have been and how should the U.S. and other countries counter China's behavior. So really appreciate this very thoughtful and detailed report. Um, so uh, joining me uh, today in talking about this critical issue are really the, uh, some of the leading thinkers um, in uh, the U.S.-China space. Um, and uh, so I'll just uh, do a quick introduction of each of them. Uh, Jude Blanchett, um, he's my go-to expert on everything Chinese politics uh, and also foreign policy. And Andrew Jory uh, from Australia. Uh, well, um, sadly, you, your country has been a target of Chinese coercion. Um, you know, love to hear more from your experience of dealing with that. Um, and Emily Blanchett, uh, he, she's the chief, China, uh, chief economist, not China, chief economist at the State Department. I'm sure uh, you will have a lot to say about uh, Matt's report. Um, and Matthew Goodman, and uh, the senior vice president for economics at CSIS. I first met, uh, met Matt in Beijing um, and has, you know, really benefited a lot from his uh, international perspectives on a lot of issues. Uh, so, and I also want uh, to let our online, uh, our audience here know that, not online, audience here know that uh, we will leave about 15 minutes uh, for questions. So you all will have, uh, you know, a chance to ask uh, some very sharp and probing questions. Um, I will start with Matt. Um, so I shared your report with a Chinese contact in Beijing. Uh, he made two points about your report. The first point was, um, he said, the U.S. has played a critical role in provoking other countries into uh, doing things that, are, uh, that have hurt China's interests. And the second point he made was, uh, very defensively, he thinks uh, you know, the pressure tactics actually have worked in many ways, especially in terms of getting some countries uh, to hold back on undertaking new actions that might be seen as sliding China's interests. I'd love to hear your response to the Chinese uh, you know, feedback to, the, to your report, at least by some of the, them. And also, if you could elaborate a little bit on your assumptions and methodology uh, in your report, that would be awesome. Thank sure. you. Thanks. Well, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks, Ling Ling. And, um, and thanks again to the panelists for joining us. It's a really terrific group, and I really want to hear from, from them, and you should want to hear from them too, and not from me, because you can read the report. But on those two points, first of all, in none of the eight cases that we examined do I see any <clears throat> American fingerprints. I mean, it wasn't an American ship that rammed um, the Chinese ship, or uh, in the Japan case, it wasn't... Um, uh, American um, uh, encouragement that got Australia to, uh, to uh, introduce its own anti-foreign inter interfer interference law or to call for a, a, um, an international investigation of, of COVID. So I just think that's sort of, at least based on the eight cases that we looked at, there's, there's no evidence of, of U.S. role. So I don't quite understand that point. If the person is, is suggesting something else, which I thought you were going to ask me about, maybe you were, but I'll just anticipate it, that the U.S. also coerces. Um, fair enough, the U.S. does use um, economic coercion. Uh, we, we address this in our report in a special box to explain why we think it's different. Um, it's transparent, it's rules-based, it has um, relief you know, possibilities. If you're sanctioned, you can actually challenge that, uh, which is not true of Chinese coercion. Um, and it is aimed at sort of um, broader objectives um, from non-proliferation to human rights to you know, preventing aggression against, unprovoked aggression against neighboring countries as we're seeing in Ukraine. 
And um, so it's, in our view, you know, completely different. Um, as, as Matt Reynolds laid out, you know, the type of coercion China uses is much less formal. It's much uh, less uh, directed at uh, sort of broader kind of legitimate objectives for the world. It's, it's aimed at China's sort of perceived narrow interests. Um, and it picks on small guys. And, it, you know, there are a lot of issues that are very different about Chinese coercion. So if that's what the person was suggesting, I just wanted to sort of preempt that. Um, and then on the other point, we do again acknowledge, and I'll acknowledge it here, that there may be a, a deterrent effect of China's coercion on other countries. Um, you know, there's this famous Chinese saying, at least it's supposedly a famous Chinese saying. I was challenged on one the other day, but I think there is actually a Chinese saying that uh, of killing the chickens to scare the monkey. Um, the one that doesn't exist is... The fish rots from its head, by the way. That is not an ancient Chinese saying. If you've ever used it, it's a very nice expression, but it's not Chinese. Um, but, uh, but the point is, by, by intimidating or threatening to intimidate some countries, that may scare other countries or into complying with China's wishes. Um, that's possible, but it's very hard to measure, first of all. Um, there's also lo lots of counter evidence. I mean, um, you know. Australia has not withdrawn that law, has not apologized for asking for a, uh, a, a, an investigation of, of coercion. That sign is still on the door in Vilnius, um, a Taiwanese representative office. Um, and, and we would argue and do in the paper that, that actually this could actually strengthen resolve in countries as they realize that there is, um, um, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that there is sort of domestically, they can say, well, China's, you know, uh, bullying us, and we can, you know, we can resist that. And particularly if we adopt the kinds of uh, uh, counter strategies that we're talking about, resilience and relief, we think that will uh, help to provide further kind of um, uh, resistance to that sort of indirect deterrent effect that China's coercion may have. But we don't deny that there may be cases where that does have a chilling effect. Um, I, I, since I've talked a lot, I won't answer the broader methodology, I'm happy to answer questions about it, um, but, but maybe I'll stop there, and I don't know if others want to comment on any of that, but please. Uh, sure. Um, Emily, um, that's, those are great answers, and, and especially the first one about, you know, the point that you made about U.S. also coerces, so that's exactly one of the questions that I'm intended to ask as well. So Emily, as uh, Matt just uh, you know, talked about the U.S. coerces as well, and, uh, but you know, the way U.S. Uh, does that is quite different from you know, the Chinese, how the Chinese do it. Uh, so, so you're the so representative from the government here. I'd mm -hmm. uh, love to hear uh, you know, how the State Department has been looking at uh, China's coercion, and what do you think about Matt's recommendations? Sure. Um, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for having me, and thank you so much to CSIS and the two Matts uh, for putting forward this report. It's very thoughtful. We may not agree with every statement in the report, and I've, uh, clearly uh, there are moments where I would not use the word coerce to describe uh, U.S. economic actions, particularly around sanctions. We'll come back to that later, I assume. Um, but, but I'm not granting that point. Um, but the report is, is really constructive in both itemizing and laying out a pattern that we see um, again and again and again, starting in, in, your, in your report in uh, 2010, and then continuing through Lithuania, and I would add to that more recently, after Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, we saw coercive actions uh, taken by Beijing against Taiwan's economy. So this is a pattern that we all see, so what do we do about it? And here I'd like to just offer a U.S. government perspective, um, humbly and also very briefly, uh, and I'll just, just make four points. So the first point, and I think you make this clearly in the report, but let me footstomp. Economic coercion, the kinds of actions that Beijing is taking to influence what countries say and what countries do, that undermines U.S. national security, and it undermines the rules-based order. It is of paramount importance that countries are free to act in their own sovereign best interests as they define it. It is also clear that Beijing is taking actions to try to dissuade countries from acting in their own sovereign best interests. So this is a problem, and we need to take action, I will say. Ambassador Rahm Emanuel said, 
with uh, his, his great and characteristic uh, um, energy and clarity, clearly has identified this problem as a key priority as, as well. So that's point number one, we have a problem. Point number two is we are taking action. So the US government is taking a two-pronged approach, not, co well, maybe coincidentally, or not coincidentally, because great minds think alike, um, clearly aligns very closely with the first two R's in your report. So our two-pronged approach is one, resilience. This is a long-run strategy to reduce vulnerability, to reduce leverage, to increase the agility of our firms and our economies to respond and reorient if an act of economic coercion is taken against uh, our own firms, or our own industries. So that's a long run approach. This is supply chain resilience. This is what we're doing in the Indo-Pacific economic framework. This is what we're doing through the supply chains component of the America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity, APEP. This is what we're doing through the US, EU, TTC, the Trade and Technology Council. This is what we're doing in concert with countries around the world, building a more resilient, more diversified global supply chains that will be less vulnerable to these acts of economic coercion. Um, that's prong one. Prong two is we respond. So understanding what we need to do and what we can do when countries face bullying by Beijing. Um, we call it response or, or relief in your report. Um, so what are we doing there? Well, Lithuania is a great case in point where we brought out our response toolkit. When Vilnius in November of 2001 faced a uh, murky gray zone embargo by Beijing, they called us. We've got a problem. And we responded. When Beijing removed $300 million of export credit to Lithuanian firms, we stepped in. XM, the US XM Bank, stepped in with $600 million of export credits more than doubling or what, what Beijing had taken away. Likewise, we supported Lithuania as they brought a case through the European Union to the World Trade Organization, to the WTO. The Defar Department of Defense signed a procurement agreement, defense procurement agreement with, with Lithuania. The US Department of Commerce engaged in a number of trade missions to build business, to build business contracts so that companies that had been selling to China could find sellers elsewhere. And likewise, we in the State Department leveraged our missions throughout the world, but especially the Indo in the rapidly growing Indo-Pacific economic region to help Lithuanian firms form new connections. So we took action and to great effect. Lithuania's trade in 2022 was $12 billion more than it was for the average five years before that. That's a 36% increase in their trade with the world. So what they've lost in trade with China, they've more than made back in trade elsewhere. So we're taking action. Point three, we know that we need to continue to build our tools. So we've deployed a tool set that worked, we think, pretty well with Lithuania, but we know that the next case will be different. There will be different sectors, there will be different companies, it'll maybe a different part of the world. And so we need to build a tool set that is agile to respond to cases of coercion as they happen in the world. As our Deputy Secretary of State Sherman, Wendy Sherman, said in congressional testimony just last month, the State Department has been hosting a number of interagency tabletop exercises to understand what kinds of tools we can deploy and how we would coordinate best among ourselves to bring those tools to bear to respond in short order if and as needed. We're also working with partners to understand what they can do and critically what we can do together. And then the last point is just our door is open. When Beijing, if Beijing threatens countries with actions to damage their economies, because of something a country wants to say or something a country wants to do, our door is open. Give us a call. We welcome a quiet conversation. Some countries will be ready and eager to engage publicly. Others just may want to have a conversation about what could happen. Key point, we've got your back. We value your sovereign independence. Another key point, critically, 
We, don't, we can't make promises in advance. But we're going to listen and we're going to be there because it is critically important for U.S. national security and the rules-based order that countries continue to be independent. So we're doing a lot. We can do more. This report is very helpful for sharpening thinking. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing all those insights with us. I'll get back to you about the new tools a little bit. So Andrew, um, as one of those uh, victim countries that are being after by the Chinese, um, love to hear about Australia's experience uh, dealing with Chinese coercion. You know, back in 2010, uh, November, 2000, uh, November 2020, I remember uh, the Chinese government presented a list of 14 grievances that must be rectified um, you know, by Australia in order for relations to be you know, back to normal. Uh, fast forward to today, we're seeing some kind of warming up between Beijing and Canberra uh, in terms of trade, in terms of uh, um, diplomatic uh, exchanges. So uh, can you uh, tell us you know, what really has changed in terms of uh, Beijing's approach to Australia? Uh, do you agree with Matt's report that you know, the co China's coercion largely has been ineffective? They really haven't got what they wanted. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for having me. Uh, here this morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, the report um, is a fantastic report, I think, and so many of these are produced by think tanks in Washington. But this report, I think, really maps very closely the experience of a lot of different countries and is unique um, in providing some policy answers. And I think in responding to your question, the, the title, Deny, Deflect, Deter, really reflects Australia's experience um, in responding to trade impediments and acts of economic coercion. I think, you know, we, I would probably agree with my colleague from the State Department that we don't necessarily see sanctions as being acts of economic coercion and I think it's important to separate those acts that are taken in transparent legal systems uh, with agreed, defined criteria as opposed to those that are more opaque. Um, obviously, Australia opposes economic coercion in all its forms. I think if we look at Australia's experience, we can see a number of things. First is trade actually grew during the period, uh, so the economy was resilient. Um, that doesn't mean that some sectors didn't feel acute pain. Obviously, they did. But overall, a lot of the traders were able to find different markets. Also throughout Australia, successive governments remained very clear on what the national interest was. And there was no change in national positions in terms of things that were asserted to be um, you know, driving the um, behaviour that ex Australia was experiencing. So in looking at that, I think there's two uh, broad areas. One is how were we economically resilient? Um, and the second is what were our proactive policy responses? In terms of how we were able to be resilient, I think it's worth noting one of the things that's in the report and also one of the things that the ambassador said earlier, which is free trade agreements. Well-functioning open markets make a difference to exporters and importers. Now, Australia has almost, will have by the time we complete our FTA with the European Union, 86% of our exports covered by free trade agreements. So that means that if there's a problem in one market, we're able to shift, not completely easily, not without cost, but there is an option there to move. Um, and if you look at some of the things that governments have done during this period, we did an agreement with India. It's not the biggest FTA in the world, but it is an FTA. And if you look at one of the commodities there um, that was targeted, wine, and you look at what's in the India agreement, there's a pretty good outcome on wine for Australian wine exporters. You look at what we've done with the United Kingdom, one of the best FTAs that Australia's ever done. 
You look at what we're doing with CPTPP partners in looking to expand that particular network. And you look at what we're doing with the United States through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. These are all reinforcing arrangements that give Australian producers and exporters choice. So that economic resilience piece is really important for us. Our politics and our domestic economic makeup is different to the United States. We're a trading nation. Uh, so having those export markets is really critical for us. Um, I think we also worked very closely with exporters to help them diversify trade through some of the outreach and diversification services uh, that were spoken about before and that are listed in the report. Um, and we also invested, I think, in critical assets domestically and also in critical partnerships, much as the US is doing here in terms of evaluating supply chains and trying to look at that. Um, you can see that there are programs of the new government through the National Reconstruction Fund that look at investing in Australia. In terms of what we did in an outward facing way, that rules-based trading system, whether or not it's through the WTO or through free trade agreements, is absolutely critical. The United States needs, Australia needs, the Indo-Pacific region needs an environment where there are rules and norms to trading relationships. That is really, really important for middle powers. Uh, we don't have the same toolkit that a country like the United States or a, a, a union like the EU has in responding to some of these measures. So having that rules-based trading system is important. Now, that doesn't mean that it's perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I've been posted here for a long time. I can see the look on Matt's face. You know, I'm well aware of you know, the difficulties that the United States and others face with the World Trade Organization. But I think it's a good question to ask, what other options does a country like Australia have in terms of the first response to economic coercion? What other responses does Thailand have and Indonesia have? Um, and there is some value, even if that system is imperfect, in shining a light on behaviour which is illegal in the international community. Um, and there is a clarifying effect in doing that. Um, I think the second thing uh, uh, that we did, uh, you know, in terms of outward facing actions, as I mentioned, is diversify our exports. Spoke a lot about that. Um, but the other thing is also, I guess, the softer forms of diplomacy. So Australia always sought to raise these issues in APEC, in the G20, in the G7, when we were part of it. Um, you know, these are all important forums and they help build a coalition of countries that are concerned about this and help shine a light on some of those behaviours. So I think, you know, our response has been very measured. We've sought to underpin the global rules-based system. We've sought to utilise that where possible. We're clear-eyed that that is a useful response, but it's not a complete response. And I think, um, you know, we've also sought to work with other partners through international fora to raise awareness of the sorts of issues that we've faced. Each response to economic coercion, I think, as the report notes, has to be you know, effectively ad hoc and tailored to the country that's facing it. Um, you know, it's a very sensitive situation that a country could be facing and we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. I think the menu of options that the two Matthews or the Matthew and the Matt have come up with are very effective here in terms of responding to these sorts of behaviours. Very helpful, thank you so much. Um, so, Jude, um, maybe, you know, my question to you, a little bit more basic, you know, it, it really touches upon why exactly China coerces the way it does. Um, when I was reading through this report, I just can't help but uh, think back to 2018, perhaps during the U.S.-China trade war. Um, there's one day Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping gathered a bunch of uh, multinational companies from U.S. and Europe and sent them very strong message. Basically, he said um, some things like, in the West, you know, when someone hit you on the left cheek, uh, you would turn your cheek, turn the other cheek. Uh, but in our culture, we punch back. So, um, I, you know, how much of the increased uh, trend, seemingly increased trend of Chinese economic coercion has to do with 
the current leader's style, belief, preferences, or it's always been that way. But we now seeing it more often because China's economy has become, you know, so much stronger. Um, so um, those are questions I hope you can help us uh, shed light on. Yeah, um, thank you. And Ling Ling knows me well, which is why she's asking a, a basic, uh, a basic question. Um, I also want to say, um, although every report CSIS puts out is is an A plus, I just think this is this is a model for think tank reports in the sense that um, the outcome of this was not necessarily what one would have thought in opening the first page. And oftentimes, I think we follow linear routes um, of uh, of basically just uh, getting to our priors after 60 or 70 pages. And so I just think this has um, really challenged the thinking um, and also highlighted an important truth, which is when we accurately describe the effect of some of China's actions, we actually zap some of the power uh, that they have. And that oftentimes inflating the effect, um, exaggerating the effect without um, you know, really doing the methodological work of trying to calibrate precisely what the impact is, does a lot of Beijing's work for it. So if you speak about some of these course of actions in an exaggerated tone, that has a, a shaping effect of, of decision making in third countries. So I just think this punctured an important truth very effectively. Um, but to get to Ling Ling's point, you know, why does Beijing do it? I think because Beijing sees a, a, a positive outcome here that is hard to often calibrate. And I think Matt mentioned this, there is often an indirect audience or, or outcome that Beijing might be attempting to shape and seek. So in addition to, as the, I now have to call them the two mats, uh, you know, outlined in the report where oftentimes the direct effect Beijing misses, there are indirect effects, which I think Beijing looks to as well. And oftentimes those are about deterring a third country from taking a similar action. Or more importantly, I think Beijing is seeking to leverage its toolkit such that Beijing's um, interests are taken into account. And that is undeniably true. I think it's taken into account here in the United States, even if we don't always pull our punches. It's taken into account in, in middle powers, and it certainly is taken in, into account in areas like the global south. I think the other thing is having spent my previous career doing consulting in, in China for multinationals, corporate boardrooms definitely take note of how Beijing wields its, its toolkit. And they're not doing the direct calculation that, that you've done carefully in the report. Um, they're simply seeing Beijing's willingness to leverage access to its market um, or leverage its external you know, overseas economic toolkit in ways that are punitive. And um, while the, I think at the margin, the effect of that on corporate boardrooms is, again, diminishing to some extent as we, we reshuffle the globalization deck, it still is very much, uh, it's very much present. So um, there's probably two distinct conversations of, are some of the direct effects there? And I think we've, we've conclusively proven that, that um, Beijing's uh, bark may be bigger than its bite in some instances but the effect is still there. And ultimately, economic coercion is about shaping political decision making. And that's often hard to quantitatively measure all the effects on political decision making, especially as we start moving outside to third countries and to subnational actors like, like multinational uh, corporations. You know, final thought on, you know, is this a Xi Jinping phenomenon? No, but I think Beijing has always understood that um, it can wield economic leverage to shape political decision making. But certainly, as is the case across the board in the Xi Jinping era, the dial has gone from eight to, to 14. I think the real interesting question, though, is looking ahead the next 10 years. I think just for structural reasons, the, the, the effect, even if it's the indirect effect, is, is going to continue to diminish. A, because I think just everyone's woken up to this. B, China's economy is on a structural decline even though it's still an important marketplace for a lot of companies and a lot of countries, it's still the largest trade partner for a vast majority of countries. If we're just thinking structurally, I think uh, people are looking to other, uh, other markets. Um, the more China uses economic coercion and the more that we highlight it, it creates antibodies that blunt the effect of this. 
So um, China, I think, is, is starting to see diminishing returns on vinegar, um, that it has been able to leverage, you know, Sub Rosa for a very long time, and more recently with, with the spotlight put on it. And again, I think that the report is going to move the conversation even further. Um, we're going to, you know, we're, we're continuing to see China move out of the low-hanging fruit era and now have to start refining its toolkit uh, even more. And, um, and the good thing is, and I think this is the case in a lot of areas where we actually name and, and shame China's behavior, we're just in the stronger position, I think, ultimately, especially when we start aggregating, you know, like-minded countries. We start implementing some of the, the actions that, that um, this report uh, outlines. I just think we're, I'd rather be on the G7 team than, uh, you know, than team PRC. Excellent. As usual, very thoughtful and insightful. And now, you know, you ask about the critical question of looking ahead. And, uh, you know, I'll get that question to Matt. Um, because, you know, most recently we seem to have seen a little bit shift in China's foreign policy approach. Some may argue it's a tactical shift, right? Playing nice, uh, especially to some of the allies of the United States in Europe and in Asia. Um, Matt, do you think China also itself has kind of realized the diminishing effect of their bullying tactics um, and trying to genuinely, um, you know, switch their approach to prevent the U.S. from building a stronger alliance with other countries? Yeah, very good question. Before I answer that, can I just amend something I said before? Because when I actually thought about our eight case studies, I realized I, I didn't quite accurately capture one point that your friend in Beijing made, which is there is one case of the eight where the U.S. was involved in the sense that it was the Korea THAAD case. Obviously, it was our missile system. But, you know, it was a, it was a sovereign or independent decision of Korea to put that there. And the reason they put it there was, had nothing to do with China. It was North Korea that they were worried about and responding to, um, to that provocation or the risk of, of, of some kind of attack um, uh, from North Korea. The Chinese think the U.S. has a hand. No, I know. Every I case. know they do, but I just wanted to correct. And, and their response, of course, China's response was completely absurd. I mean, going after a department store and, and uh, Chinese tourists going to Korea. But, but I just wanted to correct the record because I misspoke when I said none of the cases had any U.S. nexus. I would say that one is per perhaps the exception. Um, uh, but to your question, first of all, I love, I've just written it down here, Jude, um, diminishing returns on vinegar. <laughs> um, that's, that's a great expression. Um, and I think that's right. I think probably Beijing is not stupid. <laughs> They've seen the reaction this is creating and they have, uh, they have pulled back and, and maybe for that reason, but there are probably other reasons, they are on a sort of charm offensive now um, in, uh, in many respects. Uh, and in fact, let me just say something about that because it is a sort of structural issue, which is, um, if you're into international relations theory and things, you know that there are sort of two main uh, tools of economic statecraft. There's coercion and there's inducement. And, and China, of course, uses inducement. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative is sort of the, the poster child of, of that. Um, and they certainly, so this is not new in a sense that they're trying to use a sort of more positive and affirmative inducements to, to, to win over um, friends and allies. You know, but that gets to my real answer to your question. You know, that hasn't always worked so well either. I mean, they've been effective in some respects, but uh, there's been a lot of pushback um, against some of the Belt and Road projects. Some of them have not ended up well, and um, it's, it's created, um, uh, in some sense, in some places, uh, more antibodies, as, as Jude said again. Um, but China does use those tools, and those will be in a way, a, a more challenging thing for us to respond to, I think, than coercion. So in some sense, I think, um, and we're actually talking about this now, um, we need to have a, a parallel project, a, 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 a partner project to this one on inducement and the challenge for us of responding to Chinese inducement, because I think that is probably harder in a way. The coercion stuff is on some level, A, it's going to fix itself in the way you sense, but I just I say one more thing about the pro you know, once a bully, always a bully in some way. I mean, it's, it's, it's not 
uh, China was trying to do this I, when I was in the White House in the early Obama administration, you know, reaching out to Southeast Asia about, you know, uh, sort of special relationship that it had with that region. And then, you know, the former foreign minister got mad at Hillary Clinton for injecting herself into some of those issues. And he said, you know, they're big countries and they're small countries. And that scared the hell out of people. So even as they're trying to reach out and be nice to people, you know, people can see the glint of steel um, uh, in under the, well, that's probably not politically correct an, a metaphor. Anyway, can see it under the, the, the clothing. Um, and uh, so, uh, so I think, you know, the coercion is going to continue, I think, but yes, be probably somewhat diminished because of this effect it's having. And meanwhile, China is going to continue charm offensive. It's going to try and inducing. And I think that is a, um, you know, that, that is a mixed blessing for them as well. But it's in some sense a more challenging thing for us to respond to. Sure. Stick and Carol yeah. and um, divide and conquer. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Emily, um, uh, what Matt just said actually reminds me of a question really want to ask you. So this report uh, by the two Mats uh, pointed out the eight cases are uh, all involved countries whose ec uh, economies, the size of their economies are smaller than China's. So far on the government level, China hasn't deployed co coercive measures against the United States. And as you just pointed out, um, the number of initiatives that are underway in Washington to help allies and partners to both, you know, resilience, counter Chinese coercion. Um, you know, is there any debate at all in Washington about, you know, what the potential costs for uh, U.S. companies, uh, U.S. businesses, what if, you know, so far China has refrained from retaliating directly against U.S. businesses and U.S. companies? What if that were to happen and that very likely? And how would you assess the costs associated with, 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 with that scenario? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and a fair question, um, though I will say we have seen U.S. companies targeted, and in particular I'm thinking about the recent case of a, um, a tweet uh, by a, a, from the National Basketball Association, from the NBA. Um, one of its members tweeted uh, a statement in support of Hong Kong uh, not long ago, and then the NBA lost all of its contracts to show games in China for the entirety of a season, as I recall, I mean, effectively, uh, costing a, a huge amount of money. Uh, so we have seen, certainly, some acts of, of coercion against particular companies. I would say the toolkit and the philosophy and the temperament of responses in support of specific companies will be quite different than the way we're thinking about building resiliency uh, for <clears throat> countries, and again, targeted countries. And you're absolutely right to point out that Beijing PRC has targeted uh, smaller countries and uh, sectors in those smaller countries where it's got incredibly outsized, asymmetric market power, uh, where, for example, uh, a country's exports to China are really important for the target whether it's Lithuania or whether it's um, Australia, thinking about wine, for example, um, or, or, uh, or it could go the other way, where there's asymmetric market power, where China has a, basically a lock, uh, a near monopoly on the export of certain products. And so here I think about the 2010 targeting of rare earth exports to Japan. And I think the real key there is to recognize, again, we're, economic coercion as practiced by Beijing is an act of bullying. And like anybody who has had the misfortune of being on a middle school playground, uh, we know that bullies don't target the biggest kid on the playground, they go after the smallest kid on the playground. And so that remains squarely where our US government focus is today. Again, as we see, if we see US firms um, or the U.S. economy, certain sectors targeted, uh, of course there will be robust response. But I, I don't think that is the most likely scenario going forward. I, I, we'll see. 
Um, thank you, Emily. Um, I'm sure a lot of countries really do hope that the U.S. will always be there for them. Um, and Andrew, Australia is democracy, and democracy is messy. Everybody disagrees with everyone. Um, so I'm just wondering, within your government, um, you know, within your political system, there are any different opinions about how to, uh, you know, counter the Chinese behavior? You know. Uh, for sure, we have seen so far, largely Australia hasn't reversed policy, uh, reversed course in terms of its approach to China. But, you know, going forward, do you think that will stick? Uh, are there any other voices that are coming out that felt like maybe we should, you know, just uh, uh, do what, you know, at least some of the Chinese have asked for? Sure. I, I mean, I think, you know, in a democracy such as Australia, there's obviously a diverse range of views. Um, you know, I was sent, you know, in a past life, you know, to Beijing um, to represent um, the government in the Bali investigation, which was one of the first acts. And, you know, obviously, if you went back and spoke to some of those Bali farmers, you know, they really wanted to keep that market. I mean, many of them had worked for sort of 10, 15 years. So I think it's very natural that in the business community and in a democracy that there are strong voices, um, you know, for engagement. The thing that I would note is that there's been no policy change in any sense between the previous Australian government and the current Australian government in terms of the actual policy settings. So no policy settings have changed in terms of what Australia regards as its national interest. And I think the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister have been very clear on this. We will seek to cooperate with China where we can. And at the moment, you know, we are working to stabilise that relationship. We will disagree with China on matters where we must. You know, I think that the government has been very clear in how it's going to respond uh, to this and has been very clear in asking for these trade impediments to be lifted. Uh, we welcome the discussions that have occurred uh, between, you know, a range of different officials and Chinese officials and ministers. Um, and, you know, we see that as a positive step forward towards stabilising the relationship. But I think that doesn't mean that, you know, we're compromising on our values or policy settings. It comes back to what the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister have said. You know, we're going to seek to cooperate where we can, we're going to disagree where we must, and we're going to be cognizant of what our national interest is. And I think, you know, throughout this whole episode, through multiple governments, you know, we haven't seen a change in policy settings. And I think some of the uh, support that we've received from the international community, I mean, including here in Washington from Ambassador Tai and Secretary Raimondo, who've worked with successive Australian trade ministers, Minister Farrell, uh, you know, they've been very respectful in listening to what Australian needs. And I think their statements on this have been very measured. And a lot of the statements from others in responding to this problem have been very measured, which comes back to those themes that are in the report. This is a difficult situation. These are difficult circumstances that our countries are facing. Not many countries in the world are going to be looking for a Section 301 tariff type response to these issues. They're going to be looking for something much more nuanced. And, you know, we've received that support. Um, you know, from international allies and partners, and we appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, another quick, basic, and easy question for you before we open the floor up to the audience. Um, Taiwan, so uh, this report uh, doesn't cover Taiwan. Uh, I'm sure Matt can let us know why. Um, and, um, you know, obviously China has stepped up uh, coercive pressure on uh, Taiwan, you know, economic ties, etc. So how do you uh, view China's pressure on Taiwan and how that differs from the cases listed in the report by the two maps? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the case study on Lithuania, of course, is, is directly related in, and I think is also a case of trying to shape 
third country decision making on will they follow a similar route. Um, so that's directly, you know, related. And I'd also say that, you know, Taiwan also shows how both direct coercion and inducements are a part of China's strategy here. You know, China just uh, recently made progress on, on flipping Honduras, a diplomatic ally of Taiwan, and that was through the, you know, a, a combination of carrots and, and, and sticks there. So using leverage externally overseas as a way to shape political psychology and dynamics um, in, in Taiwan. And, and it's an interesting example of how this is a mixed bag when you think about China's economic coercive toolkit on Taiwan. If you look at the response, as Emily was mentioning, after the Pelosi visit, uh, you know, in some sense, I think you could chalk that up to a relative failure on China's part. It was quite limited what they did. Fish, citrus fruits um, did not have a, a demonstrative effect. Also demonstrated that China's foreign dependencies um, and interlinkages with global value chains and China's softening economic situation actually create something of a ceiling over how much China can escalate if it doesn't want to shoot off its own foot, cut off its own nose to spite its face, whatever the metaphor, the metaphor is. So in that, you could look at it and say, it isn't working. I, I think that's partly true. But I think, again, if you're looking at this through the lens of political psychology and shaping longer-term dynamics, this is an assertion of power when China uses these tools, and it's cumulative, and it's fungible, right? So China's not just using economic coercion on Taiwan. It's got a full, full spectrum toolkit of, you know, political pressure, cyber attacks. Um, obviously, the military response to the, the, the trip by Speaker Pelosi, all this is cumulative and is part of China's toolkit of trying to consistently assert power uh, over dynamics uh, um, on, on the Taiwan Strait. So that's where disaggregating the specific effect of economic coercion, while important, also I think has to tie into the broader um, strategy that China is trying to employ of, again, making sure its, its interests are taken into account when political actors in Taipei, in Vilnius, in, in other countries think about decisions. And what's hard to measure is, decisions that are not taken mm -hmm. because of factoring in what China's response may be. And that's just really, really difficult. We don't want to overstate it, which again, I think this report is really critical in grounding us to what are the direct economic effects, but we also don't want to underestimate, and which, which the report does not do at all, but I, I'm now shifting between the, import, the report and the general conversation. Of, I think going to a, a view of, well, Chinese economic coercion is, is a nothing burger because you know, it was just a minimal ban on fish and citrus fruit. Um, I think that would, in the case of Taiwan, largely miss the point. And, and just final addendum is, you know, Temley's comment on the Daryl Morey tweet in the NBA. I would say we've got a more recent example on the U.S. side if we just had two U.S. firms placed on China's unreliable entity list. It looks like a duck. It looks like it's this formalized <laughs> legal structure, but the unreliable entity list is a made-up, ad hoc, non-institutionalized, economic coercion tool that is purely about trying to shape political decision making in corporate boardrooms and, and in the United States, but critically for, for third countries. So China is as well building up this toolkit of things which look like they're institutional economic statecraft tools. But if you even read the, the, the um, unreliable entity list announcement, um, you know, it was clear that they just kind of picked a fine out of, out of midair um, there's no process for redress. There's no sort of legal, you know, mechanism underneath it. So I think we also bringing into this discussion of economic coercion, especially targeting MNCs, is looking at what look like formalized tools but are really just ad hoc political, political tools. So glad you mentioned that. Um, you know, obviously the Chinese are very um, aware of the costs on themselves, uh, as this report also laid out. Um, and I think one of the recent cases of how they find Deloitte in connection with this audit, it's fascinating case study as well. So audience, uh, let's get some questions. I'm sure you have a lot. Yes, please. Thank you. For <clears throat> Can you hear me? Great. Thank you for this wonderful report and for the really interesting discussion here today. I have a question about how some of the recommendations in the report 
square with the domestic politics and particularly the politics of this administration with respect to issues on trade and manufacturing. I think you've noted that you want the U.S. Uh, or that the report recommends the U.S. start signing new trade deals and engage more at the WTO. This administration has not requested trade promotion authority. We continue to block uh, the nomination of appellate judges to the WTO. How do we square uh, the recommendations with where the administration and the politics in Congress are now? Thank you. Well, that's, that's why they're recommendations, uh, <laughs> because we do think the, um, the administration and future administrations need to uh, use uh, trade negotiations um, and a robust WTO as a, uh, as a tool of anti-coercion. Uh, we think that that's essential. Um, Andrew, I think, more, you know, was more articulate in, in explaining why that's important to a country like Australia, but it's important to the United States as well. Um, you know, other things I've written and said, I think I've got credibility as believing very strongly that this administration should be doing more uh, to promote um, a trade and uh, trade agreements. Um, and, uh, you know, but in this context, it's really critical. So, so we, we, think it was, we thought it was important to make it, you know, not only one, but a couple of our recommendations um, focused on that. Can I add? Yep. I feel like this was directed perhaps a little bit over here too. Um, not surprised that this question came up, and I'm going to answer as diplomatically as I can. Um, so, so a few of you might know I'm, I'm actually an economics professor, uh, and, uh, and as a card-carrying trade economist, I will acknowledge readily the importance of tariffs and trade agreements for shaping long-run aggregate trade flows, the pattern of global commerce. No question. Nobody disagrees with us. At the same time, I'll also add that we tend to be a little too simplistic in our thinking in trying to describe tariffs or market access as somehow a necessary and sufficient condition for responding to something like economic coercion. That simply is not true. As we think about the kinds of measures uh, that we need to have ready to deploy um, or already deployed in instances of economic coercion, it's down at the brass tacks. It's businesses being able to form new partnerships very quickly um, with either new suppliers or new buyers across different markets. It's about a business enabling environment. And that has to do with a basic global code of conduct. This is regulatory standards and procedures. This is customs. This is governance. This is being sure that you can have confidence doing business in a country without fear of corruption charges. Um, it's labor and environmental standards that have values that are consistent with a company's own customers or their own buyers. And here, I will say the Biden-Harris administration is taking extraordinary steps, building in that global code of conduct, that sense of how we do business in the world through the IPEF, through the APEF, through the US EU TTC, and related initiatives in the ability to buy green power around the world. So then here comes PGII. This is all part of creating a vibrant, sustainable, secure, diverse global trading system and global commercial system. Yes, there's the tariff piece of that. To that, I will readily and quickly refer you to the USTR. That's their remit. But the, but the administration is making enormous strides on making firms more agile in the global economy. And we don't want to lose sight of that. Uh, it's critically important work. And again, in both responding to and preempting uh, acts of economic coercion. I, I might just do something that I've never done in my career as an Australian trade official, which is defend USTR. <laughs> but um, far be it from me to speak for them. But I do think that um, on WTO dispute settlement, um, this USTR has restarted discussions about what dispute settlement could look like in the WTO. That's very welcome. Um, I think, you know, the whole world is clear-eyed about how difficult that discussion is for the United States domestically and the pressure on them. So I think that that's a very positive step. Um, and in terms of the Indo-Pacific economic framework, um, you know, that is what the US political system can bear right now, 
is our sense. So, you know, it's up to partners to make sure that that works. I think that there are creative ways of looking at trade in that agreement that can produce valuable results for those partners in it. So, uh, you know, we, I think, you know, within the limits of the politics here, there is some movement and it wouldn't be right to say there's been no movement, but that's the last time I'll defend <laughs> the USTR, so. One, you can take one more. One there's more there's somebody way back there. Thank you. It's on. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for a very helpful discussion. I'm from uh, Vietnam. I have uh, three questions. Um, you know, Vietnam has both economic conflicts with China and territorial conflicts with China in South China Sea too. And Vietnamese economy depends on China in two directions, import and export. Vietnam depends on Chinese supply chains to, um, for its economic, for its manufacturing. It's uh, import, import Chinese material and uh, machine to uh, produce goods and then export to the US, Japan, EU, and China too. And then whenever Vietnam and China have conflicts in the South China Sea. China block its border so that Vietnamese um, agriculture goods cannot be uh, transported to Chinese anymore. That's why China, I mean, uh, Fox, Vietnam, give in in, uh, in conflict in South China Sea. So the first question, um, to, to you as, as a strategist, so, how do you think, what do you think, what the strategy that a, a developing country like Vietnam should do to escape from uh, Chinese, I mean, strategy or blockage the supply chains for the economy? And the second, second questions, you know, China also, um, Fox Vietnam quit a lot of uh, oil exploiting projects in the South China Sea with uh, international partners. Dr. Bill Hayton in Japan House in the UK estimate that Vietnam uh, have to pay about $1 billion to international partners because of it quit oil exploiting uh, what is oil your projects. I'm sorry, you have to be really close. Yeah, so in this uh, situation, uh, what the charity Vietnam should do? Thank you. Um, I mean, it's a good question, and I think um, uh, Vietnam is in a sort of, in a sense, typical position in being a very um, economically interdependent with China, um, having a lot at stake um, in terms of trade and investment flows, um, uh, having, you know, a difficult um, relationship with China as well, and in the case of Vietnam, going back a very long time, uh, but, um, and, and it is, you know, subject, it wasn't a study in our, in our um, report, but it, there probably are examples that you can think of where there has been behavior similar to the kind of things we described in our report um, directed at Vietnam. And, and I think I would still propose the basic same uh, solutions of, of resilience and, um, and, you know, in our case, helping Vietnam if it has, you know, if it has a legitimate case of coercion that we, uh, we can be helpful in responding to. So I think it's the same basic recipe of response. Um, I don't know whether Andrew or Emily have additional thoughts. I mean, I think if you look at the elements that Australia drew on, many of them are reflected in the report. You know, economic resilience was really important, having a network of other free trade agreements and other markets that could go to, um, upholding the rules-based system, using WTO cases whilst being clear-eyed about the shortfalls of those particular approaches, and then working with allies and partners 
in raising awareness of what was happening in international fora, be it WTO, OECD, G20, G7, APEC. Um, and then, you know, looking for domestic investments to build resilience as well and new trading opportunities. Yeah. Great. I think Thank we you. are out of time because the senator's We're, here. Oh, so. sure. <laughs> um, yes. Um, well, let's uh, give uh, each of our panelists a round of applause for this fantastic discussion. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. And you guys can take your seats again. Right. Well, um, that was terrific, and we needed another hour just to kind of scratch the surface, but it was a, a great conversation, and thank you all for, for doing that. Um, we're now uh, in for the, the main course of the dessert. I don't know, depending on which you prefer. I'm a dessert guy, so I'll, I'll take dessert. Um, we are delighted uh, that we have Senator Todd Young of Indiana uh, with us today. Um, he's been in the Senate since 2017. He was a member of Congress for three terms before that. He's on the committees on finance, foreign relations, uh, commerce, and small business. So he's uh, got a wide range of, um, of uh, expertise and, and responsibility across many of the issues that we're touching on actually at CSIS and in the economics program for, uh, specifically. Um, he uh, is a graduate of the US Naval Academy and was a US Marine, uh, sorry, is a US Marine, uh, pardon me. Um, and uh, has an MBA and a law degree. He's got a very accomplished background, um, and uh, that's um, uh, terrific um, uh, to bring to this, uh, all of that experience to this conversation about China's economic coercion. Um, as most importantly, probably in the specific terms of this uh, conversation, Senator Young and his colleague, Senator Coons of Delaware, uh, co-sponsored the Countering Economic Coercion Act of 2022. They've reintroduced similar legislation in the current Congress just last month, and I'm sure the Senator is going to talk about that. So with that, uh, let me uh, please join me in welcoming Senator Young to the stage. Thanks. 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 Really appreciate it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you for the generous introduction. I want to thank CSIS for hosting this important conversation. Um, I always look forward to an opportunity to uh, visit CSIS. Consistently, it's, it's this think tank that uh, tackles uh, pressing challenges and, and tries to tease out uh, practical ideas uh, to handle them. And I think uh, that's certainly applicable uh, to today's conversation. I just returned uh, several weeks ago from Japan and Taiwan. In fact, I was uh, the first member of Congress to visit Taiwan in 2023. And I visited with uh, a number of government leaders, uh, business leaders, and other stakeholders, sought to provide some measure of reassurance uh, to uh, all of those leaders about the U.S. presence in the region and our willingness and, and eagerness to find ways to deepen our, our partnership uh, with, with our friends and, and uh, others uh, in, in the area. Um, and I, I wanted to send a message that there was going to be constancy uh, to our support as well. There's been some question uh, about that moving forward. I, I prioritize this trip because uh, there is indeed unity on Congress in, within Congress as it relates to this competition. There are some exceptions, uh, of course, and many of them are, are quite vocal, but uh, I see uh, support for our allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region as being uh, a real area ripe for uh, practical solution implementation over the next couple of years. We discussed reinvesting in trade and uh, commercial ties uh, throughout the region in particular, but uh, we also discussed military relations, the importance of, of reinforcing those relationships, uh, as well as our diplomatic and, and development uh, posture across the entire region. It's important that we prioritize all of these instruments of power if we're to capably partner with like-minded governments and societies in the regions, in, in the region as, as we uh, tackle a host of different challenges. But I think we would all agree that the most taxing geopolitical challenge uh, that we're faced with, if, if we're to define it broadly, is 
how to stop the CCP's uh, ambitions of dominating first Asia, and uh, then we have to assume uh, much of the rest of the world with their authoritarian model. I won't, of course, unpack every facet of this challenge today. Uh, that's, that's not uh, the scope of, of this conversation, but I want to discuss one major aspect of the CCP's aggressive tactics, and that is economic coercion. China has, has used uh, coercive measures as a uh, cudgel to force governments to accede to their propaganda and policies on things as diverse as Taiwan's sovereignty and the origins of the COVID pandemic. And this coercion is not limited to just the Indo-Pacific region. We witnessed this when China blocked imports from Lithuania for having the courage to question the CCP's one China policy. Worse, political and security coercion are, are quick to follow when economic coercion succeeds. These threats and, and grabs for power, of course, can't go unchecked. So last month, I, I reintroduced legislation that uh, Matt mentioned with Senator Chris Coons that provides our country with another tool in our toolbox as we compete with China. The Countering Economic Coercion Act would give the president the ability to help our foreign partners on an expedited basis when they're targeted for standing up to authoritarian regimes. On an, specifically, on an emergency basis, it gives the president authority to do a few things. First, decrease duties on certain imports into the United States to make up for a partner's lost exports. Second, increase duties on imports from the bad actor. And lastly, expedite the regulatory process for increasing bilateral trade. Additionally, it directs the coordination of U.S. efforts, and I think this will be key, coordination of U.S. efforts with partners and allies to ensure that China faces a unified front. These are authorities we really need to approve right now so that we don't squander the opportunity to provide a clear alternative to China when the next crisis emerges, as it inevitably will. The CCP thinks it can drive a wedge between our allies and partners by using economic intimidation or by harming economies through opaque informal actions. By supporting our partners under threat, we protect America's own national security interests. When I visited Tokyo, it was encouraging to see that combating economic coercion is a pillar of the new Japanese national security strategy. <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm sure Ambassador Emanuel highlighted the importance of this as well. Clearly, our allies, especially those threatened by China, are taking this challenge very seriously. There will be, of course, no sol silver bullet for managing China's external actions over the coming decades. No single trade deal, no single speech, no visit uh, by a delegation is going to be sufficient. Even shoring up our eroding military deterrence in the region won't by itself put the United States and our regional partners and allies on the path to competing with China and, and reaching what one commentator has described as a decent peace. I've been encouraged by the actions of, of successive administrations to shine a bright light on China's bad behavior, and begin the process of reducing our vulnerability to economic and political coercion. But much is left to be done. And global challenges threaten to distract us from what must be our primary global priority. This must be a priority, again, for Congress on a bipartisan basis, and also for the executive branch. In the 21st century, our mission must be to use all the tools at our disposal so we don't risk having to commit America to another war, potentially, uh, for the security of the Indo-Pacific. I appreciate your attention to these important matters and for holding this important conversation today. Thanks again to CSIS, and um, we'll look forward to working together on some of these issues. Thank you, Matt. Yeah.
have a, have a seat right there. Take this away. Please have a seat. Thanks so much. Thank well, you. Thanks, Senator. That was terrific yes, sir. and, and um, a great sort of compliment to what we were talking about earlier and touched on uh, some of those issues, not all of them. Um, if I could ask a couple of questions, um, if, you, if you'll um, of course. Uh, forbear. Um, so in our report, we um, looked at these eight case studies and we you know, came away with a conclusion that you know, China's coercion is problematic and, and disruptive. We need to try and do something to deter it. And we um, concluded that there's sort of three R's that you could use to do that, um, which are retaliation, resilience, and relief. And we found ourselves drawn more to the resilience and relief R's, as it were, rather than retaliation, because, um, because uh, you know, it's not clear that the retaliation of, is, effect is going to really change China's behavior. And you know, there's a cost on us to, do, to take those uh, steps. I see in your legislation, the new version of the legislation, and you just mentioned it, that you have included the notion of, of raising tariffs um, as a possible response. But most of the rest of your um, a bill seems to cover many, much the same ground as us, you know, creating uh, an ability to uh, improve trade um, uh, flows for victim countries, provide relief to them to coordinate with allies. So I guess my question is, how do you see that balance of different tools, and do you think um, it's likely that, which of these things is most likely to change China's behavior? Senator Kuntz and I thought it was important to have both a carrot and a stick uh, dimension to this legislation. Um, I, I don't question the scholarship or, or the findings of the report. Uh, I do believe uh, that, you know, each of us uh, and the, the leaders who, who will in the end make these decisions, like Xi Jinping, uh, responds to incentives. So, um, you know, the, the, the possibility that there will be retaliation, not just by the United States, but by other large uh, G7 economies, uh, as we hope there will be, once we link together these, these national efforts, uh, hopefully starting at the G7 meeting in, in Hiroshima in, in May, uh, I think you're going to see considerable leverage uh, potentially brought to bear against the CCP. And, and so I, I suspect that that dynamic, since it has not yet uh, been seen, uh, was not incorporated into the current analysis. So, uh, uh, but uh, we think it's important, rather than to provide too few authorities to the administration, we, we provide additional authorities, and, and then as, as uh, you know, this plays out real world, these are new challenges we're meeting and trying to bring new tools to bear. Uh, the president can uh, decide to either exercise the punch uh, in addition to this helping hand or, or just the helping hand, if, if that makes more sense. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we had all the tools that were necessary to help out, especially a, a smaller economy, Pacific country, uh, in the case of, of future economic coercion. Great. Well, just to be clear, we, we do think it's important and, and applaud your effort to try to create a kind of a package of tools that, uh, that can be used. In fact, we call it something. We call it the U.S. anti-coercion <laughs> instrument, um, sort of echoing the European um, package of, of tools. So I uh, totally think that's, that's right. We have to have a toolkit. Uh, did you yeah. want to add something? Yeah, you know, this debate is, um, it, it's very important that it continues uh, to happen uh, uh, about the, the relative efficacy of, of, of the punch versus the helping hand. It's one, frankly, that is analogous to our, our domestic criminal law debates, right? To what extent uh, does the possibility of future punch, punishment really deter action? And um, I think most would concede that, at least on the margins, it makes some impact. It also uh, is an important, uh, you know, sort of moral statement by society uh, about particular things. But uh, I think there will be considerable debate about the, its deterrence effect. And I suspect this area, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think same thing will occur. Really, yeah. yeah, disagree. I think I, think I yeah. agree with, with yeah. much of that. Um, so let me ask, and by the way, if, the, if you're willing to take an audience question, oh, sure. I'll invite them to yeah. jump in. So I always, think, I always think like to say, it. you know, if, if it's a hard question, just submit it by email. <laughs> that's right, that's right, and your staff will answer it. Um, okay, um, 
so you talked about the G7, and it does look like the Japan is trying to broker some kind of G7 uh, statement about this issue, and possibly, do you expect them to actually talk about specific tools? And, and then, you know, what's next after the G7? Because G7 is the largest industrialized economies. You know, who else should be part of a broader group? Do you think there are other countries that, that ought to be part of a broader coalition on this issue? You know, I, I, I do, and, and uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida, he's, he's, he, you know, this is, has been his number one priority for the G7. Of course, will be in his hometown in, in Hiroshima, and um, he's, he's taking great pride in and focused very much on the details of this conference. Uh, he is, he's done a G7 tour already, visiting with heads of state who will descend on Hiroshima in May, and, and um, uh, he has put together a consultative agenda I am told uh, by our ambassador that economic coercion will be the top item on the agenda. So I suspect in light of the spade work that uh, he has done, showing exceptional leadership, we're going to see um, a commitment in principle to work together, but probably some more details. And then, as often happens with these things, uh, the, the real work will be dedicated to teams of, of staffers who will go and, and uh, figure out how to operationalize all of this. But uh, I think it's very exciting. I, I, I think in fairly short order, we're going to see a large economy, free country alliance uh, that uh, is uh, putting together a toolkit to, to counter economic coercion. Right, great. As a former G7 yak, that is the deputy Sherpa, the person who helps the Sherpa take is the president. Is that your term or is that no, actually? It's a, okay. it's, it's a sort of affectionate term that we, right. we, uh, we deputy Sherpas used to call ourselves. <laughs> I got a haircut, but, uh, but, but the yaks were, were, uh, were a great team. But I, I would just endorse something. You said it's much more powerful. People get cynical about statements by leaders on things, but actually it's a really important function to set an agenda and say, you know, there's an issue here that we care about as leaders of these um, largest, you know, advanced market democracies. And then the acts and the, and the folks below take that and, and push it forward into specific action. So I think it, it will be more significant than you think, maybe, if, if the G7 says something. So that's great. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just I want to use this opportunity in case anyone uh, notices uh, to really commend the leadership we're seeing in Japan. And it's so important between uh, the, the military budget and, and, and now this, and, and uh, they're really, they're providing the sort of partnership that we need, especially in a dangerous world where, where you know, we have other priorities and other geographies as well, so right. it's fantastic. Let me try two other quick questions and then, they're not quick, they're hard questions, but, or they're, they're big questions. Um, one, we were just talking about the role of trade policy and, you know, whether, the U.S. ought to be um, engaging in a sort of more robust uh, uh, trade policy along sort of more traditional lines of market access opening and so forth. Um, and and it, that's one of the recommendations of our report to help diversify, yes. you know, supply. It needs to happen. Right, and, on coercion. And, uh, and, and also to do something to get the WTO working again because that's also part of a toolkit. If, if you can use the WTO, it's not going to solve the problem. but. It's an important signaling device. So I guess, you know, what's your perspective on trade and how does that feed into this, this conversation? Well, if I were to do a midterm report on the administration on this issue, it's, it's uh, you know, a D, okay? Uh, as others would think that was a generous grade, right? Uh, because we, we really need, in order to have meaningful trade conversations, we need to offer reciprocal market access and, and go through Congress and do all the things that we do. But really, the grade is incomplete. There's a final exam, and I want to give the administration the opportunity to step up and uh, at least do some of the easier things. Increase trade with Taiwan, Kenya, maybe the UK. I mean, there's, there's, there's some easy wins that I would encourage the administration, even in the run-up to a presidential uh, you know, uh, campaign, uh, to take. And I think uh, there is no better way to improve resiliency, another focus of, uh, of your report, than uh, by having meaningful conversations and then agreements related to trade. I agree with all of that, um, uh, <laughs> um, but won't say any more, um, uh, or I'll get in trouble. Um, so uh, I just want to ask one more, you already kind of addressed Taiwan in your remarks, but we did talk a little about Taiwan, and, and I didn't get a chance to answer Ling Ling's good question, why we didn't really 
uh, zero in on Taiwan in our report. It's not that we don't think it's important, um, but it is a big issue as Jude, I think very eloquently answered. Um, you know, coercion, economic coercion is sort of part of a bigger uh, set of things that China is doing vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. And we thought, you know, that would sort of distract from the other uh, important cases that we, we did look at in our report. But I want to ask you on Taiwan. I think Taiwan. most people who are sort of following these things know that Taiwan is, is being coerced. Is that right. sort of exactly. your point? Exactly. I mean, you want of, to demonstrate it's a broader challenge. And, right. And, and does it sort of fit, though, into, like, does your bill have something that targets that issue in particular? Or is there sort of a broader set of issues here that we have to think about vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? Uh, we, we empower the president with the same toolkit uh, for Taiwan as, as he might apply to Lithuania or Australia or, or, or some other country. So we, th we think the same tools apply. No, no unique tool set, uh, toolkit as it relates to economic coercion is required for Taiwan. But here again, it would be really helpful if, if we were to have a meaningful market access conversation with Taiwan. That's, that's the best thing we can do to uh, prevent coercion. And I'm allowed to say more on that front. You may not. I, I mean, I'm supposed to be able to say that, but I get in trouble when I do for some reason. Okay. Um, uh, so let me invite the audience, if you have a question, to raise your hand. We do have some microphones, and um, I'd welcome uh, a question or two before we have to let the senator go. Um, th does anybody, uh, everybody shy at this hour? There's a gentleman there. And um, I want this side gentleman. The there we go. Yes, yeah, all right. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, Good, can you identify yourself for the yeah, rest? Yeah, my, my name is Philip Gunn. I'm with the uh, Washington Export Council, and I'm also a former Hoosier. Uh, former uh, Hoosier? Is there uh, there's no, it's Unless like a former dead. Marine. I was going to say. I'm that's right. I'm in DC now, so I'm going to say that that's over. Um, <laughs> my question is, and I would have asked Dr. Blanchard the opposite end of this question, this but the... don't you think that um, IPEF could be a good tool or a good framework when we're trying to create In a century's worth of uh, frameworks for competition, and then don't you think that that could be a good, a good framework for developing free trade agreements in the future? So do you have a view on the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework I, and how I it think it's play? great. I, I, th I think it ought to be uh, complementary towards uh, a, a genuine free trade agreement. And by genuine, I, I, I mean what is historically been considered uh, to constitute a free trade agreement, market access. So I, I, I'm not critical of IPEF, uh, except for what seems to be an administration attempt to, to uh, indicate that they're seriously engaging in trade conversations uh, and, and using IPEF as a substitute for uh, an actual agreement. And, and, and listen, we could revisit history because it is political about why trade become, became a more difficult issue in this country. And I, I acknowledge all of that complication. But um, for the good of our country and our national and economic security, uh, we, we need to complement the good efforts of IPEF with a very serious actual trade negotiation. Okay, I agree with that too. Um, I want to make sure this side of the room, which I haven't recognized, uh, doesn't have a question before. Uh, all right, Bill, why don't we take that over there, and then if we've got time, that gentleman over there. Thanks. Uh, it's on. I think it's on, Bill. Okay. Bill Reinch from CSIS. I want to pick up on Matt's initial question about the tariff incentives and disincentives in your bill. Uh, do you think that using them would violate our WTO ob obligations? And if so, do you care? Do I do care? care? <laughs> I th I, listen, I, I, I think we need to be seen as a reasonable actor, and to the extent uh, that we uh, are following both the spirit and the letter of the law of, 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 of our, the World Trade Organization that, that furthers that goal, uh, it is my belief that this is uh, WTO compliant, uh, but uh, if indeed it is not, I, I, I don't think most in the world most in the region, as we think about the Indo-Pacific, uh, would consider the United States bad actors. After all, the intention here, and I think the, it, it won't be lost on, on most others, the intention here is to aid sovereign countries uh, when they are on the receiving end of the weaponization 
of economic interdependence, something not really contemplated when the WTO, uh, uh, when, when, when China ascended, uh, ascended to the WTO. So uh, because they have weaponized economic interdependence, that has led to a, a, a situation where um, <laughs> we, are, we are seeing retrenchment of various countries and it's actually undermining the global uh, economy and uh, trading relationships that countries have. So in order to counter that, the United States, working with Japan and some others, is leading on an effort uh, to provide some uh, measure of, of stability to global trade again. So I actually think it's certainly consistent with the spirit of the WTO. Okay, and quickly that gentleman back there. Hey, my name is Ryan from APCO, and uh, the panel touched on this a little bit before, but it was the private sector. So how, what is your thoughts on how they should navigate this? What's your expectations for them? We heard Rahm Emanuel earlier said the NBA folded up like a cheap suit, and uh, just wondering, uh, yeah, what, how should they? The NBA, Ambassador oh, Emanuel said oh, yeah, the I, NBA I, I folded I do know what like the National a, Basketball right, Association is. Right, but he said that they. I'm the U.S. They, Center for Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you play basketball yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, um, he said that they folded uh, in yeah. response to the Chinese coercion. So, yeah. And sorry, so what, what do we do about private? Uh, yeah, just what, what is your view on how do you help the private sector? Yeah. What is the expectation on the private sector to also res respond to these acts of coercion? Well, listen, I, 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 I think Ambassador Manuel, uh, speaking plainly about this issue and many others, as, as I and others have, um, naming, shaming, embarrassing those so you can kind of sh change the calculus, uh, again, even if on the margins for the MBAs of the w world, in this case, um, I think it would have been, in all candor, difficult to shift the calculus just through domestic public opinion sufficiently in order to change the NBA's behavior because, uh, I mean, they are all in on um, the Chinese market. Uh, but there's that, trying to educate and inform the public, and increasingly the public is, is really focused on this issue, as we've seen from uh, the, the de-investment uh, in, in China by state pension funds. Right, so that the public does care. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, the other point uh, I would make is there's a real opportunity here for the private sector as well. Uh, there's an opportunity for the private sector to identify when countries are, are being coerced and, and uh, they'll end up advocating with the administration and, and members of Congress to uh, impact the decisions of the administration because they see an opportunity they see an opportunity to increase trade with the coerced country. So I, I, I think many of the incentives that will be created through uh, these anti-coercion legislative and foreign policy efforts will be positive, uh, but uh, this, this isn't a panacea. As I said before, this isn't you know, a, a silver bullet, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. No, I think we have to be realistic about that. Yeah. That's, a, that's an important point as well. But look, really thoughtful, uh, very helpful um, comments that, that uh, uh, help round out our conversation today, which is not the end of the story. This is going to be a continuing conversation yeah. here at CSAS and I'm sure beyond in Washington. And we'll look forward to following the progress of your bill. Thanks. And uh, you know, we're happy to keep the conversation going with you. If we can be helpful, let us know. But for now, can you join me in thanking Senator Young Thanks, for being man. with us today? Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you at the next uh, event. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.